Earlier this year, I was talking to a fellow researcher who works at a large software development company in San Francisco. We were just telling each other a little bit about how our different research teams did our work. And at the end of our conversation, she asked me how the researchers at MailChimp take their research and package it before they give it to the product team. She was really struggling to find the best way to communicate her team's research to the people who built her company's products. A few months later, I was talking to a group of systems analysis and design students at the University of Georgia. I was telling them a little bit about how UX research works and how research fits within our company. And one of the students raised her hand and she asked me, how do the researchers at MailChimp get company buy-in? How do they get people to listen to them? These two conversations and many others that I've had, they make me realize something. As a community that builds products and services for people, we're getting better at the research part, or at least <laughs> we're talking about it more. We, we realize the importance of understanding who our customers, who our audience is, and what they need to be successful. We realize that in order to be a successful business, we have to understand not only what kind of services will fill a need, but what services people will actually want to use. But even though we understand the importance of research, and we understand the importance of understanding who our customers are, we're not always taking those next steps to making sure that our research is communicated and that it's given to our companies. Communicating research is something that's really hard to do well. It's almost like understanding the value of a healthy diet for our families. We go to the market and we, we carefully select healthy fruits and meats and vegetables and we take them home and we put them in our refrigerators. And then we never actually cook them. Those healthy foods that we've so carefully selected just sit there in our refrigerators being wasted, just waiting to be used. And sometimes our research just sits there, waiting to be shared. Now I realize I'm, I'm talking to a group of entrepreneurs, online store owners, marketers, and maybe even some designers, developers, and writers. And you may be thinking, I'm not a researcher. This, this doesn't actually apply to what I do. But just hang with me. Let's not get caught up in the technical term research. It may not be in your job description or in your job title, but if we think about it at its most basic function, research is simply asking questions, listening, observing. Research is just a fancy word for learning. And learning is something that we're all responsible for. We're all responsible for understanding and gathering information about our customers either by collecting it ourselves or by collaborating and working with others. If we don't do that, then our work is just guessing. It's, it's kind of like trying to throw darts at a dartboard while you're blindfolded. We might hit the general area of the dartboard, and maybe, if we're lucky, we might actually hit the bullseye. But complete accuracy just isn't possible. Research can be compared to removing that blindfold. It gives us vision, it allows us to make informed decisions. It allows us to aim our dart, if you will. But even with that blindfold removed, we still aren't promised perfect accuracy. And, and that's where consistency and practice come into play. Research and product development work in a similar way. We learn about our customers, we build a product or service, and then we iterate. We learn a little bit more, and we refine, and we improve our products and services. Our accuracy improves. I work for MailChimp. It's a company that is a platform for sending out email. And at MailChimp, 
All of our departments are responsible for gathering research. They're constantly talking to customers or reading through feedback or keeping up with the best practices in our field. But we also have a team that's dedicated strictly to research, and that's where I work. This is a team of qualitative researchers and data scientists who not only try to understand how our customers use our services, but how those services fit within our customers' lives, their businesses, and their everyday workflows. We do things like conduct surveys and analyze data. We watch web traffic, and we conduct interviews online, on Skype, and in person. We do competitive analyses, and we run usability tests. And all of this information helps us understand who our customers are and what they need to be successful with email. Research eliminates some of the guesswork for us. It gives us vision to create better products, to create better companies. Like I said, we're getting better at the research part. But gathering research, gathering information, and learning about our customers is only half the battle. What happens after the last survey response has been submitted? The last usability test participant has left for the day. The last interview question has been answered. What happens to all of that valuable information? Where does it go? Research is only truly valuable if it's shared and if it's put into the hands and the heads of people who are responsible and people who have influence to make change. Change in design, change in product offerings, change in company direction. So how do we do that? Well, let's go back for a minute to the two conversations that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. In the first conversation, a researcher wanted to know how we package and communicate our research to the rest of our company. She was concerned with format. Do you use a chart, a report, a presentation? In the second conversation, a student wanted to know, how do you get company buy-in? How do you get people to listen and do what you say? The way that her question was worded and the tone that she used led me to believe that she was concerned with authority and power. How do I place myself in a position of authority so that people will do what I say? Now, I don't question the motives of either of these two women. They, they want to create a good experience, a good product for their users. And in order to do that, they have to get the people who actually create those experiences on board. I also think that their questions and their comments mirror the approach that many of us take towards sharing research. But I think we need to tweak our approach. Successfully sharing user insights isn't about finding the golden standard of research deliverables. And it's not about authority or power. Successfully sharing research doesn't actually restart with the research itself. And it doesn't even start with our products. Like so many other things in life, it starts with people, our colleagues. Sharing user insights, our goal for sharing user insights shouldn't be about asserting power over people, over our colleagues, so they do what we say. It should be about empowering them, giving them the information that they need to do their jobs well and to create good products. How do we know what they need? How do we know what's important to them? Well, the simple answer is ask. This is Brian Grazier. You may not know him by face or by his weird, crazy hair, but you probably know him by his work. He's produced films like Splash and The Da Vinci Code and TV shows like Arrested Development and 24. And in 2002, he won the Best Picture Academy Award for the film A Beautiful Mind. But let's take things back a few years. 
In the 80s, Grazier began his first job at Warner Brothers Studios delivering legal documents. But he had somewhat of an unusual personal goal. He challenged himself to meet one new person in film every single day. He'd call people up and he'd say, hi, my name's Grazier, I work for Warner Brothers, this isn't official studio business, and I'm not looking for a job, but I know your work, and I just want to talk to you for five minutes. And so we started meeting people. He met executives and actors and directors and agents. And this habit of his continued after he got his first producing job at Paramount Pictures. Eventually, Grazer began meeting people outside of Hollywood. He's met people like former Chilean political prisoner Veronica de Negri, US President George W. Bush, fashion designer Ralph Lauren, and boxer Sugar Ray Leonard. In 2007, Grazier was named by Time Magazine as one of the most 100 influential people in the world. And it's easy to see why. Over the years, he has collected quite a network of designers, agents, executives, political figures, writers, and actors. The thing to remember, though, is that Grazier didn't approach this goal with the purpose of getting something out of the people that he met. In an interview with the Wall Street Journal, he said that in order to make these meetings worthwhile, you have to enter the psyche pretty quickly of the person you're talking to, to kind of know what matters to them. And if you know what matters to them, you're learning more, and you're living in their mind and process. When you know people, and when you know what's important to them, you're able to communicate with them better. And while this story focuses primarily on someone in film, it applies to all industries. It applies to what you do, it applies to what I do. A very dear friend of mine once told me that whenever you meet someone, always think that you will have a part in their future, or they will have a part in yours. So when I meet with one of our designers for coffee. I'm establishing a relationship with them. I'm not trying to get something out of them, but I am very aware of the fact that we both play roles in each other's lives and in the lives of the future of our company. So when the time comes for me to share some kind of research with them that maybe Maybe something with our product isn't working the way that it should, or maybe something is confusing or frustrating to users, or maybe we're not going in the right direction. I've already developed a rapport with them that makes those difficult conversations just a little bit easier. If we want our research to be influential, we'll see greater success and faster results if we first take the time to open channels of communication with people. And once those channels are open, then we can consider the information that will flow through those channels. The Mozilla research team has created these, these charts, these cards about their user types. And they use it to help introduce their user types to the rest of the company. They wanted to enforce the idea that we're designing for users, not for ourselves. And these cards help them do that. Nick Bomast is a design researcher out of New Zealand, and when he works with clients, he doesn't like to just pass along a report or a document. He wants something that's visual, something that tells a story or demonstrates a workflow or illustrates somebody's interactions with a product. We have so many options for how we can share information, but we have to start by building those connections with people and opening those channels with those that we work with. We learn what's important to people, what's valuable to them and their work. And then we begin to understand how to communicate with them the best way to share information so that it's used. And I want to wrap all this up into a few examples and how to, just to show how that might work in an office. And to do that, I want to introduce you to some of my colleagues. This is Allie. She's our product marketing lead. 
Understanding users' motivations for why they use our products is important to Allie and her work. So when it's possible, she likes to be a part of our interviews so she can get a first-hand understanding of who our customers are. This is Tyrek. He's one of our designers. And Tyrek actually likes reports. He'll take a report that someone has sent him, he'll print it out, and he'll skim it for the major points and topics, and then he'll go back through and he'll read it slowly from beginning to end. And then he'll put it on the side of his desk and he'll leave it there so he can refer back to it throughout an entire project. Chris is, our one, of, is one of our engineers. He likes it when research can be given to him in multiple formats. So for example, the research team developed a series of customer personas several years ago and created several different deliverables for that research. We created posters with brief snippets of information and words that described each persona. We created a chart that provided a bit more information. And then we created a long form report that had a lot of detail and descriptions. For Chris, these three different formats gave him the chance to learn about personas in the time that he had available throughout the day. The posters and the charts, it gave him quick information that he could absorb fast. And it inspired him to carve out the time that he needed to read the full report. All of these three people play different roles in our company. They have different contributions to our product. And by understanding these differences, I'm able to communicate with them better and give them what they need to ultimately create better experiences for all of our customers. What I want to leave you with today is this. We're all researchers. We're all learners, even if it's not in our job title or our description. We're learning on a daily basis things about our customers, our companies, our competition, and our industries. This knowledge, though, can only be truly useful if it's shared. And the only way that we can do that is if we learn how to communicate better with the people who are around us. Thank you. Marissa, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, what was the most interesting fact you had found in your research in MailChimp? Oh. MailChimp. Um, oh, that's really hard. I don't like that question because there's too many. Um, probably the most interesting fact was we just learned this year that 54% of our customers are outside of the United States. And since our company is an American-based company, um, that really tells us a lot about how we need to think about how we design our products in the future. And no chimps are using MailChimp. Unfortunately, no. That'd be great if they were. <laughs> uh, Daniel loves your accent. Thank you. It's Atlanta, is it right? I, I guess. I'm, I'm not really southern, so I don't, I don't know what accent I have. <laughs> and the last one, do you use only quantitative researches? What do you think about qualitative researches? So I'm primarily a qualitative researcher. On our team, we have, um, I believe, three qualitative researchers and one primarily quantitative researcher. And then we have about six data scientists. So while I work some with quantitative analysis, I primarily do interviews and competitive analysis and observational work. Thank you very much, yeah, Larissa. Thanks.